Imagine, folks, if you will. Okay, I'm not going to do a Twilight Zone intro. So uh, today I am bringing along a friend of mine, Craig, and we're going to discuss the Synod of Jerusalem. For those of you who don't know, there was quite a bit of a scandal centuries ago where what seemed like uh, the heretical machinations of an ecumenical uh, bishop of Constantinople were folding right over and basically parodying Cal uh, Calvinist and Protestant talking points. Of course, uh, the East, being a very diligent, was quite quick to be skeptical and even accusing Calvinists of creating a plagiarized, uh, well, not plagiarized, but uh, a false narrative where one of their patriarchs was uh, speaking heresy as a means of uh, propping up their own doctrine. But others were not quite so sure about this. Of course, we had a patriarch who was also a political figure who also was dealing with Jesuits and Ottomans at the time. What is the case? Whatever it might have been. And what they ended up doing was convening a council at Jerusalem, a synod, if you will, uh, more specifically, where they not only ruled uh, much later on that it was, uh, in fact, a forgery, they also created a set of documents uh, reaffirming the Orthodox faith, although in highly Latin terms, what is the true teaching of the church. Since then, uh, Roman Catholics have utilized this document as a way of uh, showing that there is actually tremendous overlap still between Eastern and uh, Latin theology. But uh, even today, there are Orthodox who are fairly hesitant to even accept it as such because there are heavily, heavily loaded Latin terminologies and maybe even theology that are coming through that might not be as accepted. Um, there was at one point the uh, Russians who were very hesitant to transcribe um, this, count, this uh, synod. Now, what are we to make of it? Uh, well, joining me today is someone who is Eastern Orthodox, uh, Craig uh, and Forgive me, I'm, I don't know how to pronounce your name without Trulia. Uh, butchering. Trulia, thank you. That, uh, butchering it, uh, thank you. He's going to help us navigate these historical waters. And I'm actually kind of curious because when I offered him this opportunity, uh, Craig was very quick to jump on board and discuss this with me. So have you looked at uh, the Synod in-depthly? And if so, uh, what kind of excited you? Well, it, it seemed like excitement. What seem to excite you so much as to just jump on board uh, with this project, at least today? Well, it's great to be on today. Um, hopefully I don't get your COVID, which is why you're wearing that mask. It, it's but transmittable you, on the internet, yes. It, it is. You know, all, <laughs> all sorts of viruses are, I hear. Um, but it's a shame we won't have the Twilight Zone intro. Maybe you could edit the video and add it or something. Do, do, but, do, um, do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that aside, uh, the Council of Sithias um, well, I call it that. It's it's my it's actually the Council of Jerusalem was held in Bethlehem when they were uh, blessing a, a, a new church that was built there. Um, but it contains the Confession of Dositheus. This document, like you said, is Latinized. Um, I've read it um, cover to cover, I think, three times. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe it's twice, and I otherwise just looked at certain portions of it several times more. So I have a pretty careful understanding of it. I've also read other um, contemporary documents like uh, St. Peter Mogila's Confession, which was a very similar Latinized document a few decades previously, which did have, and which we'll talk about, um, uh, the authority of all the patriarchs of the Orthodox Church at that time. Uh, so what interested me was not so much, because some people are interested, oh, what's our response to Calvinism? Or what's our response to Protestantism? Or how are we, you know, ecumenists, how are we like Roman Catholics? That really wasn't my interest. My interest more so was that I like being a conciliar completist. Um, I might be, right now, the only person that's Orthodox in the English language to have read, keywords English language, every single council and document translated into English. Um, though, to detract from myself, I have not read the entirety of the councils, the canons from Trullo, so that I'm not fully a completist yet. But so the reason I say that is when you read every single council that ever occurred and all their minutes and all their decrees and all their canons, you start getting a feel for what they're really talking about and how the ideas repeat themselves over time, even certain languages uh, certain things and words in the language change. Like, uh, example, this early on, 
would be the Council of Nicaea using the word hypostasis synonymously with the word usia or substance, like we co co commonly in the Latin parlance. Um, but a century later, hypostasis had a totally different meaning. It meant the persons of the Trinity, and now we could have three while we could have one usia or one substance. So it's not, we can't oppose the changing of the meaning of words or words that once had a bad meaning or have a foreign meaning being put to orthodox use because it would render all the conciliar documents incomprehensible in that event. Um, so I guess, like I said, my interest is more generally historical, not so much with an ax to grind to try to disprove something or, or any other motivation. Well, uh, thank you for that uh, great intro. Now, sticking to the historical aspect, but actually a little bit before that, I just want to make another disclaimer for anyone who is viewing this video. The mask is purely there because of better sound quality. I assure you, I do not want to be featured on video with uh, pantyhose wrapped around my microphone or something <laughs> akin to that. This mask actually does a rather good job of capturing the pops or little incidental scratches or uh, when that might be breathing in through the microphone. So uh, I am not stir crazy yet. And, but uh, you know, I, as soon as we prolong this uh, self, self isolation thing, we might get there, but to go to the historical aspect, let's actually go with the event that pushed the synod together, which is Sarah Lucarius's, uh, uh, well, uh, let's just say uh, confession quote, end quote. Was it, uh, was it a forgery? Was it real? Because it seemed like before the Synod, um, there were times when uh, people were of two minds about it. Some saying yes, some saying no, some saying it, it was, but it was more politically motivated. It wasn't really something he did. In any case, um, Cyril Lucarius is considered to be a martyr who, d who did die for the faith. So whether it was or wasn't, he is still considered to be uh, someone who is venerable from the Orthodox perspective, if not for uh, teaching the Orthodox faith, at the very least, for, for dying for his communion. Uh, but, uh, yeah, to answer the question, did he do it, uh, at least in your view? Well, keeping the historian hat on for a second, this will be the historian hat, the The consensus really is that he really did write it. And I've heard this from several sources, uh, not only um, at St. Tikhon's uh, monastery and the seminary, where they teach and everyone that, that he pretty much went crazy, um, when he was out in the West. Um, I remember actually speaking to someone writing their PhD dissertation on this, and he was going to University of Albany at the time, and he had that view as well. Um, clearly, uh, the he never refuted it in writing, which is interesting, and so all we have are these statements that, yeah, he said that he didn't really write it, but nothing explicitly to that effect. Um, we also know that he did teach Orthodox sermons, we also know that he did say critical things to Protestants writing to the Russians. Um, let me add some a little background to this. So at this time, the Bishop of Constantinople was essentially like in captivity because the Turks obviously ran Constantinople. The Turks would pretty much, as we know, Cyril, Saint Cyril of Karis, we'll talk about in a second, died. So they martyred him. So they would control policy by just killing the Bishop of Constantinople and putting someone more pliable after him, plus you had to pay them in order to ordain him. So we could already see it's really a miracle from God that things can get really bad really fast under such a system, right? That where you've got people that aren't believers choosing their most powerful bishop, having subjugated all the autocephalous churches in the Balkans because they were autocephalous um, before um, the Turks took over Bulgaria, Romania, Serbia, etc. For uh, and, those of our viewers who don't know what the word autocephalus is, what do you mind expanding on that? Autocephalus means they're they're not only autonomous, can make their own decisions. They're considered like equal churches. Oh, so I like see. in so in in let's say as a rough comparison, because we don't have a view of infallibility for any for bishops. It's like the bishop of Rome. The buck stops there. In orthodoxy, the buck stops at each individual patriarch. Right. So really, they're. They're like the Bishop of Rome with their own jurisdiction, their own area. And so while autonomous would technically still be accountable to the patriarch. So like we have autonomous churches like uh, Ukraine, but Ukraine still gets their um, holy chrism from the Bishop of Moscow, 
even if they're financially independent and otherwise they canonize their own saints and do everything on their own, but they're spiritually under the oversight of, let's say in that case, the Bishop of Moscow. So, uh, so to, to translate it maybe into uh, political terms, if we understand uh, Roman Catholicism to be an absolute monarchy of sorts, then what we would consider the Orthodox Church to be is a monarchy in the sense of it being uh, a constitutional or symbolic monarchy with the first among equals uh, viewpoint of the ecumenical bishop, but every other bishop having very high levels of aristocratic control, um, where uh, their bonds together are in um, sharing the same faith and having communion with one another, but with uh, the primacy of the ecumenical patriarch being that of a constitutional head, whereas the autocephalous churches um, each have um, each have their own power and control over their own land, similar to uh, a feudal lord uh, might. Uh, is that a fair comparison? It's close enough. No, nothing's going to be just get right at it. Like, you know, right. so like we'd be closer to the articles of confederation and the Roman Catholic should be closer to the constitutional form of the United States government. You know, if you're, if you're going to look at it like that, but it's, um, there's no perfect comparison, but yeah, roughly. Right. But now, so under this, uh, this background, Sarlo Karras, like any Bishop of Constantinople, never had enough money um, because one, you got to pay off the debts of getting ordained. Um, and two, essentially blood money. If you don't keep raising money, they'll kill you. <laughs> so he travels all throughout the, he travels all throughout Europe. So um, for example, the, he goes to Russia, right? Like you read about like these Greek guys and you, you don't think they get around, but they, they're in Kiev, they're in Moscow, then they're in, then they're in Switzerland. Like, what's he doing? And essentially, he's a high-level diplomat trying to get money and allies where he can. And it is a high-level political game, which is why in Constantinople there's French Jesuits. That's why uh, in Constantinople there are, you know, Russians and, and all this stuff. You know, so there's a political aspect to this as well, with, with the hope being if we have enough pressure on the Turks, outside pressure, it helps put me in a more stable position to shepherd my flock. Mm -hmm. And it's a very tough game that the Bishop of Constantinople had to play for about 300 years and until like, you know, the old man of Europe, you know, the Ottoman Empire started collapsing in the 19th century. So that being said, it makes sense wearing the historian's hat that Cyril Karras would in Russia say one thing, back home say one thing, Right, because the, the, the Jesuits there, Orthodox are there, right? So you say one thing there, and then amongst the Protestants say something else, all in the hope of drumming up support and telling them what they want to hear. Um, now, taking that off for a second, right now this is my plain old Orthodox hair. <laughs> the Orthodox have an iconified view of history, just like we have saint lives, and we treat them as literal historical fact, mm -hmm. even though – it would be arguable that not every aspect of these stories are little historical fact, but in taking them as such, it, give, it conveys spiritual truths and helps us see the guidance of the Holy Spirit throughout history. But you just can't be overly literal with every detail. So the idea that these are forgeries protects the memory of a martyr who was canonized about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. All right. So by taking that point, it's like saying that, um, what's his name? Epiphanius um, never, you know, really wrote those things against icons, like the Seventh Ecumenical Council said. You know, those were forgeries. Now, I'm putting my hat back on. As, as a the historian hat, it's very unlikely they were forgeries. And in fact, I'm speaking of Epiphanes for a moment. In fact, if we accept he really wrote those things, it actually strengthens the historical argument in favor of icons. And this would, that would be a whole different episode. But I, I bring that up because... Oftentimes, the church isn't concerned about winning apologetics argument. It's concerned about maintaining the integrity and dignity of the saints, mm -hmm. and uh, which because the saints are the church. They're in heaven, and there's saints now alive on earth. They're just not glorified yet. They're still, um, you know, they're still the church militant in that sense, in, which I in, think uh, is the terminology actually from the Confession of Decipius. In, uh, in terms of biblical analogies, and this is one I, I often use when addressing the Pontiff of Rome, even if uh, one might not like him personally, or one might find something that uh, seems particularly scandalous. Uh, there is a kind of precedence in, uh, for example, scripture where 
uh, Noah, after his abominable behavior, was naked, and his children uh, put on clothes and blankets ju- right over his body just to hide his nudity. Mm-hmm. Uh, this doesn't mean that what uh, Noah did was uh, wasn't wrong or immoral in some kind of sense, but rather it's just a reminder that children do have kind of a responsibility of uh, protecting their spiritual parents' um, uh, shortcomings, at at the very least, onto the world. Like, this is why I'm not too fond of uh, Catholics who, who even though might have disagreements with the pontiff, uh, will, you know, call him Bergoglio or uh, do a lot of other things that I find fairly disrespectful, even if uh, I might not personally agree with him. I'm not somebody who takes family issues outside and publicly castigates that person. Um, I think that's kind of the similar understanding with the saints and uh, their role as spiritual fathers of the church. Uh, now, would that I be a fair? Yeah, I don't, I don't mean to be racist. If I remember right, your, your background's Arabic, yes. and my wife is Cambodian. So mm-hmm. I reason why I bring this together is we're so used to talk about these issues like Western Europeans, like Americans. We forget the way the rest of the world thinks and acts is totally different, mm-hmm. right? They don't air their dirty laundry. They have dignity. and They treat people with <laughs> dignity like such. So, like, in my wife's country, they have a dictator named Hun Sen. He's been in power since 1980. He's, in fact, the world's longest-running dictator at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll leave my opinions aside about Hun Sen. But you think, right, in my house, you would always be talked about very negatively, right? Just like every president we have is, right? We don't even call him President Clinton, President Bush, President President Obama, President Trump, right? We used to call people from titles in this country, and we even lost that level of dignity Mm -hmm. in discourse. Now it's Trump, it's Obama, you know? But you would never do that in the foreign country. Even if you don't like them, you can hate their guts. (laughs) But you would never do that. (laughs) Exactly. there's this sort of dignity that people don't treat people in that position in that sense. And so in Western discourse, which is what I consider your channel, because you're speaking in English, and I think you're Canadian. I forget, I forget exactly. Right? Are you in Canada? Uh, I, am Canadian. I am Canadian. I said, unfortunately, jokingly, but yes, I am a Canadian. I'm a dual citizen. And okay. uh, to be fair, even in terms of my own background, I haven't been a good era because I'm, I've been very guilty of this in the past when I've, been a new coming Catholic. I've been very upset at uh, at this uh, at uh, the at uh, Pope Francis at certain points and junctures. And I've unfortunately aired dirty laundry. I'm I am very repentant of that. Um, but in terms of like learning more about the faith, like uh, when it comes right down to it, and, and seeing its precedence in in Scripture at the very least in the example of Noah, and also seeing the fact that other Catholics in other parts of the world are scandalized by this behavior, and even your example of your wife, I, I can definitely see why this is a kind of mindset I need to take up personally, and also even looking at this historical episodes with the saints as well. Well, and, and exactly in your point, the exact interpretation you gave is given by by Saint Photius the Great mm-hmm. and Mystagogi the Holy Spirit, I believe, in the fifth book. I can't I don't the, the paragraph memorized at the moment. But he literally says, if, if in fact, because he didn't actually concede it, St. Augustine and St. Ambrose and St. Jerome really taught the filioque, he said. Well, we don't air out their dirty laundry. He said, we cover the nakedness of our fathers. And so we can't be surprised that throughout church history, this is how the church operates. And this is really how most cultures throughout the world operate. And so that's really more my point. It doesn't mean you're a perfect Arab or my wife's a perfect Cambodian. It's all irrelevant. But it's a good stereotype to help understand how this history plays out. Mm-hmm. And so that's why at least I could see what both sides are getting at. I can answer mm-hmm. the literal historical question for you and give an analysis, mm-hmm. but I also see the importance of how the church has viewed itself and how they've preserved and discussed the the memory of this martyr. Oh, and that's a fair point. And you know what, I'm glad to have you with the historian hat on as well as the Orthodox hat on. Uh, I'll have to get another hat. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the uh, okay, so the confession seems to not have been a forgery, at least uh, from uh, your background knowledge and, and assessing people who have studied this more in depthly. But at the same time, you can recognize how one could say it's a forgery in the sense that we're we're going to expunge its memory from our understanding of this person, especially considering um, all the good they've done for the faith. I uh, will be happy to just say that it's not him confessing what is the Orthodox faith, but rather it's him. Uh, just uh, saying what needs to be said for getting allies, which is what one would have to do as a diplomat and as a political figure. 
And now let's actually get to uh, the, the meat of it. Uh, why is the council um, going to be expressed in very Latin terms? Is it uh, because they're dealing with Protestants who themselves are educated in, in, with a Latin background um, and basically telling them that, no, what we don't believe is what you believe. And here are some words you could understand to understand this. Is it is it because uh, many of the uh, prelates might have had a background in uh in uh, in Rome, I, I believe that's what it was at the time. Uh, could it have been a case of both? Uh, uh, what's your take on that? I'll give two short answers, and maybe I'll flush them out to the best of my ability. Um, one would be yes, education, Orthodox education, even to this day in Turkey, for example, was illegal. Was truncated. They weren't able to educate domestically, so they had to go overseas, which would have been Russia or or Italy, particularly Florence, if I remember right, in order to get educated. So the language of education was with Roman Catholic terms at that point in time. Um, and even the best scholars um, that Orthodoxy was putting forward, like St. Peter Mogila in Kiev, um, that was under Polish domination until, um, you know, sometime until the early mid 1600s. And so that was under Roman Catholic control. And that was Orthodoxy's first seminary in history, right? Their first college, real college in history. And it was really people that were admittedly very Latinized and they were dealing with uniates and with Polish scholars. So th that's the context behind the education of these bishops. So it's also left out, but sometimes overly emphasized for ecumenist reasons is that the Orthodox were welcoming Roman Catholic bishops and teachers to come and actually teach Orthodox because they couldn't do it. One, they, they couldn't educate their own people. And two, they had like diplomatic immunity. Right. So if a Jesuit came as a really in part a French diplomat and he was educating people in Constantinople, he could get away with it because he could start a war with France if you kill him. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so so you would welcome him to teach while, um, you know, you have the thumb over the bishop of Constantinople under whatever bishops are in communion with him and you could stop them from doing it. So to a great extent, actually, we have primary sources that show they welcomed Roman Catholic teachers. And generally speaking, it had positive fruits because it preserved Christian teaching, right? Because mm -hmm. without that, the result could have been much more conversions to Islam. So um, it had bad fruits as well. So I'm not here to make apologies for it as it's a great thing. The Melkite schism is a perfect example of this. And so the reason I point that out is because over a hundred years, everyone's educated by Roman Catholics. Eventually, it's not like they don't have good arguments. You get a bishop that legitimately goes, well, I want to be in communion with the Pope, and he does it. And so the actual bishop of Antioch um, went to communion with the bishop of Rome, and then the bishop of Constantinople um, ordains a new bishop of Antioch. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, it's the first time in history where we actually have not the Roman Catholic Church making a parallel church in a, a foreign land, but really the Orthodox doing it, vice versa. Now, it's telling it took how many centuries after the Crusades for it, for it to happen the first time. But so that's why, you know, in a large respect, you have to appreciate the legitimacy of Melkite claims and Melkite orders, like as in like, uh, like there's no question that they really have all that succession going back in time because they don't have a foreigner thrust into there. They really were the mm -hmm. bishop that really were the bishops and whatnot of that jurisdiction that went to communion with Rome. Mm -hmm. um, it'd be a different episode where if I were to give a defense, the Orthodox defense to that, but again, I'm just trying to give both sides. So there's good fruits that preserved the Christian faith and there's bad fruits. It did cause schism. And obviously that was the Roman Catholic, um, motivation. It wasn't like, oh, you know, lovey-dovey, let's help everyone. It was a way of exerting influence. And they had uh, secular patrons, particularly France, in order to get this done. But if you're just the, the average person, average Christian in what is now modern day Lebanon or modern day Syria, you know, how are your kids going to get educated? Who's going to teach them how to read and write and teach them math? Well, the friendly Roman Catholic's going to. Right. And so where are you going to send your kid? You're going to send him to that school. Yeah. Um, and so we have that to this day, for example, but now with Roman Catholics, Protestants do that in my wife's country, in Cambodia. So who's going to make the most converts? The Protestants, because they're giving people something they need for their kids to survive. And then 
in time, they learn the faith. This has been the most successful way of converting people in the long term. That's why the Philippines is so solidly Roman Catholic and they have abortions illegal and they are preserving the Roman Catholic faith where they are with the percentage of Roman Catholics in that area. In Latin America, we have a, a, the opposite problem, though, where because a lot of um, charismatics are there, they're providing long-term provisions. We're seeing a lot of uh, churches losing out uh, souls to, uh, to Protestants who are now becoming charismatics. So uh, mm-hmm. that, that's another example in your favor as it, well. It's, it's ironic. It's way past this conversation's point, but it's sort of like Protestantism really works better with the neoliberal economic model, like with a flattening world and it's all about advertising and all about this or that. The Roman Catholic and Orthodox models have historically followed what the, how the world was until the advent of capitalism, which was very top down. You convert the king, you convert the civil service, and then you provide to get into the system, into the hierarchy, you must be now part of that religion, but it trickles down, it's very effective. I mean, there's a reason why the Philippines is Roman Catholic. Yeah, and so, or, or oh, Russia, you know, and all the people Russia converted. So okay. it, it works, but that's what the Roman Catholic strategy was in Lebanon and Syria. And it wasn't strange. It was the same strategy that's been going on since Constantine. And, and you know what, uh, which, which is funny because you hear all these so-called trads who are attacking Pope Francis for, uh, for communism, apparently, uh, because he's attacking the neoliberal model in the newest encyclical. And yet he's actually quite correct to point out that neoliberalism has actually been kind of a strain on the Catholic faith. Now, I'm not actually – now, I wouldn't say he's saying that uh, because the right of the conversion <laughs> for the right reason. But no, I'm saying uh, it's not communistic, though. There's been a lot of great uh, precedents for attacking neoliberalism uh, for one reason or another within the Catholic Church. And it's not communistic because uh, that's another thing. Uh, in the West, we think, oh – if you're not teaching capitalism, you're by default teaching communism, which, um, which of course, isn't the case because you could still have the essentials uh, such as private property and money, monetary transference, class systems without going to uh, communism, but without being capitalist as well. Uh, but uh, to move on, uh, unless there's any other point. And there's like the that. other answer because <laughs> it was supposed to be short and they got too long. I know. The, the other answer would be, so one is education. They're used to those words. The second is Protestantism from the Orthodox perspective, and your audience I presume is mostly Roman Catholics, so it'll be offended. I'm giving the Orthodox perspective. Right. It's a schism of a schism. So <laughs> it's intellectually removed from the Orthodox faith two times. And so how do you talk to people where they got none of the concepts in common? So, for example, if you read, St. Maximus, if you read so on, even if you read St. Maximus, you read, you know, Mark the ascetic, you could read pre-Protestant Reformation, Roman Catholic saints like St. Thomas Aquinas. They use the term faith alone. They don't mean anything that the <laughs> Protestants mean by it, but the terminology is not bad. But now how do you talk to people that have taken the term, have run with it, have t- totally changed its meaning? Now you got to say something new that applies to that. And so with the uh, sacramental heresies, the Protestants, the soteriological heresies, the Protestants, the eschatological heresies, the Protestants, the Roman Catholics in Trent in being that most Protestant heresies are developments from what, in our view, Roman Catholic heresies, the terminology all pertains to stuff Roman Catholics have already worked out. So it wouldn't make sense to just strictly give Orthodox, an orthodox answer to it because it really wouldn't address the actual issue. People wouldn't get it. So I personally don't do that. Um, like when I uh, mm-hmm. talk about orthodox doctrine, mostly because I'm more learned in first millennium sources and second millennium sources. Mm-hmm. So I don't have the updated vocabulary. Mm-hmm. Um, but that being said, there are some ortho- there's some Protestants I heard complain saying orthodox won't give you a short answer to a question. And the reason is, Because if I give you the short answer, you're just going to automatically presume it's Roman Catholic, which will kind of segue into when we get into this council. People just automatically presume it means Roman Catholic stuff, but it's the only way I could tell it to you succinctly without unpacking, well, those words don't think what you think they mean, and there's all this background to what we think Hades is, what we think this is, what we think that is, that you have no concept of because you're you're two schisms removed from Orthodox. So that's the other reason why I think there's so many – um, Latinized terms, but sadly, 
because of what is popularly called the word concept fallacy, it makes people afraid of the Council mm -hmm. of Jerusalem 1672 because it, so it doesn't sound orthodox, even though properly understood it is. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, let's uh, get into the first topic, um, which is the level of authority the Synod actually has on the faithful. So if I were to show you in, in some place that the Synod did uh, teach an error, uh, of some kind that would not invalidate the orthodox faith like if it uh, like if i showed you an ecumenical council such as uh, the fifth one would invalidate the faith uh, or at the very least it would be very different in terms of its weight or consequence uh, w would that be correct no not exactly and, oh, and this good. is yes yeah, this is why the Orthodox view of authority is very different than the Roman Catholic mm -hmm. view. The Roman Catholic view essentially has, ultimately, if a pope has said it infallibly, that's how we know what's true. And so I think there is two ex cathedra statements that are indisputable, mm -hmm. um, both pertain to the Theotokos in the Roman Catholic tradition, and there's ecumenical councils ratified by the Pope of Rome, which is how they know they're ecumenical. And so really, it's the same thing both times. It's when the Bishop of Rome has spoken ex cathedra and identified this as having authority as it pertains to faith and morals, it is now dogmatically binding and incontestable. The, the, the orthodox view is much more wishy-washy, and it actually comes out um, in the actual Council of Decithius. Um, and I'm trying to find the actual part of it, but I'll just, I'll tell you where you can find it and you can read it in more detail. It's in, and man, it's a very long answer. It's question four in the Confession of Dositheus. And I'll just say this. It makes a passing mention that the hymns, the Manian and these other liturgical hymns of the Orthodox Church, are the Holy Spirit speaking like Scripture. Now, you'll never hear a Protestant say that, obviously. They'll never say amazing grace is inspired like Scripture. And you won't really see Roman Catholics saying that. They won't say hymns don't have authority, they're not like historical sources like the fathers, but they're not like the scripture speaking or as incontestable as the scriptures like an ex cathedra statement would be. But orthodoxy doesn't have that. So if we accept their hymns and questions why, it's because they've been received by the whole church. And so if we accept certain writings of the fathers and we say, well, no, this writing from Athanasius is like the scriptures, not because it's inspired directly word by word by God, but we recognize it as dogmatically binding and contestable. And that belief has been received by the church and we receive it as such. The same would be true of councils. And so what people don't popularly understand is that even local councils were treated this way. Um, but the question is, how do you really know, right, that everyone has really received it? And so, for example, with the local councils of Carthage, there's a couple of them. Um, but there's one, the 110th canon of the 419 AD council talks about original sin. Well, canon two of the sixth ecumenical council receives the canons of that council as canonical. So that local council is essentially ecumenical. But even without that, we see that in the council of Ephesus and the council of Chalcedon, when they depose bishops, they're using a local canon from the a local canon of Ant Council of Antioch. And so there's this undercurrent orthodox thought that if orthodox people, even in a local area, worked something out, as long as people don't identify it as heterodox, then it is binding because the bishops are all the shepherds of God's people. Um, so it's this more amorphous view of authority and you can't, it's like nailing jelly to the wall. You can't nail as easily what everyone has received, um, but it's pretty easy to identify what we have received. So, for example, to answer your question about the Council of Jerusalem 1672, which would be that because I, I – remember, we're looking at the English language, so I can't tell you um, which bishop signed on to it because I don't have the information handy. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe every – remaining member of the Pentarchy signed. We do know there were Russian bishops there. We do know that the uh, that Russia received the whole council when they translate to Russian to, into Russian only with minor changes. Mm -hmm. And so it has been received. It has been used in ecumenical dialogue with Anglicans, for example. 
Um, it's been cited um, by all four bishops, remember right, in their reply to the Pope in 1848. So I believe, I argue, it's been adequately received, um, but I'd say the spirit of the language is what people are rejecting. And so in a sense, we must take that as what hasn't been received ha would be taking what is said in the council in the Western sense. We would only accept the sense of the council in a more traditionally orthodox sense. This can utterly frustrate a Roman Catholic, you know, listener because it doesn't make sense to their view of authority. But that's why I'd recommend read question four, and it'll give you a kind of a taste. Because right, we just we all agree this is a Latin sounding document. But mm -hmm. when you read the answer to question four, and it's pretty long, you're going to see a lot of stuff you'll totally agree with. Talks about hyperdulia, theotokos, and you're like, oh, that's a term we use, and absolutely, it's a great term. It's a Greek term, but not, not only that, it's, it gets into this issue of other councils and other fathers that have authority like the scriptures. And it's just, it's an orthodox way of thinking that doesn't make sense in the Western paradigm. And you really got to swim in those waters to get it. You know, and that is definitely a fair point. There is a distinction uh, to be had between the spirit of the language and of the council itself, maybe even being rejected. I mean, it's not like uh, I don't reject a certain spirit of a certain ecumenical council that happened uh, earlier uh, in the 20th century. Uh, I think a lot of more uh, conservative Catholics uh, such as myself do. And um, in terms of the hymn thing, I, I think hymns are a very fantastic way of communicating true doctrine held by the early church, even if you don't want to, you know, give it uh, that same inspired sound if uh, uh the language of the hymn is saying something like um uh i'm just going to use the O oh, virgin pure i know it's uh, it's the one i know best even though it's a uh, very recent um uh you, you also have to understand O oh, virgin pure immaculate O oh, lady theotokos like that actually encapsulates a lot of orthodox theology right there right off the bat and now Immaculate is not considered the same as the Immaculate Conception, but I think it's fair to say that uh, even the Orthodox have some kind of notion of uh, the Virgin being Immaculate, maybe in, in some oh, sense. Definitely. We you have know. a hymn on the, on the, in the Menayan for the Conception Theotokos, or the one of the lyrics is, we hymn, you know, thy Immaculate Conception. So <laughs> we have the actual words. I mean, this is not the episode. I can tell you what it means, right. but it's, th this is part of the problem where people... They fixate on words and they think it means what the other people think it means. Right. And you have to actually look at how it's used at the time, like uh, like using legal examples. When um, when somebody like uh, Justice Scalia uh, looked at uh, the words of um, of what the Constitution would have meant to the average person reading it, he's not necessarily doing historical work on how Jefferson specifically took uh, – a specific word to mean. He's actually looking at how the common person would have done a uh, nation of laws, not man. Uh, and on top of that, he wouldn't be using a modern dictionary. He'd probably be using a dictionary as old as uh, or near as old as the Constitution can get uh, to. So uh, that's also something else. You have to look at um, how the word would commonly have been used by thinkers at the time and by the fathers at the time, maybe uh, before the council as well. Uh, so now, those are more people listen to you about that. That's a big problem I have is convincing people of that. <laughs> and no worries. I I usually take my guests at their word, uh, especially if I bring them on. Like uh, if I didn't trust you, I wouldn't have brought you on. Uh, it's only fair. But let's get to the first of the teachings. Uh, Trans let me just read one thing on the notes. I did find the passage uh, in question four. It says, for all such books, talk about the deity as one and yet of more than one personality that even in the hymns, some gathered out of the divine scriptures, because so much orthodox hymns are Psalms, right? And others according to the direction of the spirit. In order that in the melodies, the words may be paralleled by other words, we sing parts of scripture. So here we see the hymns very explicitly said, well, and if not right from the Bible, they're still written by the Holy Spirit. Oh, all right. Now let's first get to the article concerning transubstantiation. All right. Uh, now it's now here's what it says in Decree 17, and I'm gonna just read it out loud. We believe the whole all holy mystery of the sacred Eucharist, which we have enumerated above, fourth in order to be that which our Lord delivered in the night in which He gave up for the life of the world. 
For taking bread and blessing, he gave to his holy disciples and apostles, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. And taking the chalice and giving thanks, he said, Drink you all of it. This is my blood, which for you is being poured out for the remission of sins. In the celebration of this, we believe the Lord Jesus Christ to be present. He is not present typically or figuratively, nor by superabundant grace as in the other mysteries, nor by a bare presence as some fathers have said concerning baptism or by impartation, so that the divinity of the word is united to the set forth bread of the Eucharist hypostatically, as the followers of Luther most ignorantly and wretchedly suppose. But he, but he is truly and really present, so that after the consecration of the bread and of the wine, the bread is transmutated, transubstantiated, converted, and transformed into the true body itself of the Lord, which was born in Bethlehem of the ever-Virgin, was baptized in the Jordan, suffered, was buried, rose again, and received up, sits at the right hand of God and Father, and is to come again in the clouds of heaven, and the wine is converted and transubstantiated into the true blood itself of the Lord, which as he hung upon the cross was poured out for the life of the world. End quote. Now what's really interesting here is not only does it give something which seems very uh, Latinized in terms of explanation, but it's contrasting itself from uh, two heretical understandings of the true presence, which can be found in uh, Protestant circles. So, for example, the idea that Christ is present in the Eucharist in the same sense he's present in the waters of baptism, that would be more virtual presence in which the Calvinists believe. Um, Whereas uh, they're outright calling Luther and saying, yeah, he's wrong too. It's not like some hypostatic union redux. Uh, what's really going on here is that Christ is present in a very real sense. Uh, uh, would you like to uh, comment on that and tell us how that might be uh, taken as being Catholic, whereas it might really be something else? Or do you think there's actually a lot more that lines up here with the Catholic view? Honestly, it's pretty much almost entirely the same. Um, I would put two, uh, I think the terms provisos, but like, you know, two things we got to just be careful of. One would be in the last paragraph where it says further, we believe that by the word transubstantiation, the manner is not explained by which the bread and wine are changed to the body and blood of the Lord. That is altogether incomprehensible and impossible except by God himself. And those who imagine do so are involved in ignorance and impiety. It also speaks elsewhere in that same decree that people by their vain philosophies are mm -hmm. trying to interpret this. So that brings me to the second proviso. One, we use the term, we, says what we say what happens, but it's still mysterious in how which this occurs. The second would be there's limitations to what we could philosophically um, extrapolate from this. So for example, if it's right in the council, we agree that the substance of the bread is Christ's flesh. The accidents are um, bread, for example, still tastes like bread. It could still mold. They'll do all the things bread will do according to its accidents. What we don't do is then say that, I'm gonna use a tangible real world example, because the accidents are still bread, if you're allergic to bread, you will definitely get sick. Mm -hmm. Now, so for example, in Roman Catholicism, you could have a gluten-free Eucharist. Now, to, to put my hats off, Roman Catholics, it still must be made of wheat. And so they have some process to remove as much gluten as possible to the point where it would be scientifically gluten-free, but there's, I forget how many parts per million gluten, you know, compared to what there was before. So it's not, it's still wheat bread, right? Mm -hmm. Now, liberal, uh, liberal churches, particularly the Church of Finland, um, has requested permission from their mother church, which is Constantinople, because they essentially went to schism to leave Russia for obvious historical reasons and then enter communion with Constantinople, um, have asked permission to have a gluten for Eucharist for a very similar reason the Roman Catholics do. There are people that do get sick, and we could talk about that, but there are people that do get sick. They really are allergic to um, or have an immune response, if you want to be scientific, to gluten. Why not have a gluten free Eucharist? And the Orthodox Church answer has always been no. Um, the Orthodox Church answer has always been you cannot get sick from the accidents of the bread and wine unless you commune unworthily. And so it shows that while we have 
an extremely similar concept. We avoid the logical extrapolations based on the same constructs because in the Roman Catholic viewpoint, it's completely philosophically consistent to say, you're allergic to grapes, and yeah, the wine, according to its accidents, will make you sick, even though it really is Christ's blood, mm -hmm. right? There's nothing, there's nothing illogical about that. Mm -hmm. But the orthodox theology is, yes, we'll use those categories, but we will not use those categories as premises to make further logical extrapolations of based what this bread and wine as Christ's flesh and blood will mm -hmm. do. So it's almost identical. That's the very slightest of difference. It's something actually I found shocking mm -hmm. when I started looking into this was just how dismissive they were of people getting sick from the bread and wine. And it's become a real issue now since COVID. And now we see in Orthodox today, really lack of a better term, a liberal camp, in a, I'd say, a reactionary camp, the liberal camp will be very Roman Catholic. They like, they, sadly, they will not use the terminology of this confession mm -hmm. of Josephus and say, well, it's because it's accidents and it's substance and blah blah blah. But they mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. And the reactionaries are really just sticking with what was always believed, which is it can't make you sick unless you commune unworthily. I will add this one thing, so your viewers aren't scandalized. In our pre-communion prayers, we always pray the God of mercy in us because we always commune unworthily. So that gives God the always has the excuse to let you get sick because <laughs> you're never worthy enough to commune. Um, we're always sinful and we always need the grace of God and his forgiveness. So I'll, I'll just say that. So it's not going to surprise anyone if someone who's allergic does get sick, even if they're otherwise not more sinful than someone standing next to them. But also it doesn't surprise us when people who are legitimately allergic do not get sick because our theology permits that. Uh, one other thing I should also add, um, in terms of uh, mystery as well, I think the East and the West have very different understandings of what mystery entails. So in uh, the East, uh, I think when somebody says such and such is a mystery, uh, they're saying it's it's in some sense inexplicable purely through uh, a, a philosophical understanding. No philosophy is ever going to uh, f uh, fully elaborate this. Uh, whereas in the West, I think it's more along the lines of the Trinity, uh, transubstantiation. These are mysteries because you're never going to use a natural revelation to get there. No amount of natural revelation is going to tell you that the um, that when you see the Eucharist, you're not seeing... Uh, bread and um, you're not seeing wine, um, you're seeing the body and blood of Christ. That's something that requires revelation to teach you. So I, I also think that that might also be a difference as well. The Orthodox uh, and, and the East just generally um, don't like to fully explicate things in terms of a philosophy and don't think a philosophy is adequate to get that. Whereas in the West, we can permit uh, a philosophy to get a lot of the details, but at the end of the day, um, you're never going to get there with uh, natural revelation. Uh, do you think that's fair to say? Yeah, there, there's experience? a major epistemic difference, and it mm. comes ultimately from the writings of uh, St. Uh, Dionysus the Areopagite, or Pseudo-Dionysus. It's a whole other debate, but point is it comes from him, and I'm not going to pronounce the word right, but apopathetic, or however you say <laughs> it, um, you know, theology, which would be a theology of negations. We know what God is, is and we know what he's not right as mm -hmm. in whatever god has it explicitly revealed i am this he anything that is not exactly that we know isn't true mm -hmm. and not only that what he reveals he is he's still beyond all those things so for example saint maximus calls god god beyond god what's that even mean because the concept of god doesn't encapsulate god you know his his essence um, is far beyond what human beings can contemplate. And so this is something that informs all Orthodox understanding of reality, right? Because it almost sounds, um, I don't know, it almost sounds like how can you know anything that's true, right? If you really only have revelation and then all you know is what's not a revelation isn't true. So mm -hmm. it's just this whole other way of thinking, and which is why so much is emphasized on mystical understanding, on actually the ascetic life, and then really having the Holy Spirit give you insight to things, which is often beyond words. And we see that in the scripture. You say Paul says he went to the third heavens, and he heard things that cannot be spoken. And so the Orthodox have this way about that, but that's why 
it don't it don't work in the Western world because right, like in the West, it's all about figuring things out and getting it done. And that and that's not the worldview. There's a reason why the Industrial Revolution, the Enlightenment, all these things happened in the West because their epistemology, in my opinion, allow for it. It didn't happen in China, it didn't happen in Russia, it didn't happen in Greece. Mm-hmm. Right? That doesn't mean there weren't Greek writers that weren't extremely important, let's say, in the Renaissance. In fact, Barlam was the Greek teacher for Plutarch, right? So it's like there's these guys that are big names within orthodox controversies, which really were behind the scenes mm-hmm. and major intellectual developments in um, in the Western world. But it's, you know, for better or for worse, if the whole point of human history is building a uh, a better car, a better atomic weapon, you know, a fancier cell phone, that Western epistemology is great. <laughs> you know, you're not going to get it done with a, a the, with a philosophy and epistemology of negations. But the question would be for us, speaking of religion, what's better? We're not going to solve that today, but that explains why the Orthodox could have this sort of document and just, just not leap to the same way, the same conclusions and the same way employing it that the West would because the difference is epistemic. Right. And, but to be fair to uh, the Catholic communion, uh, I would say that anyone who has the same understanding that's present in the Council of Jerusalem, um, at least the positive things, not the denunciations of the Catholic part. But if uh, someone was to come in and hold the Eastern Orthodox view of tr- of uh, transubstantiation, uh, what's the Greek word? Meta. Oh, I can't pronounce it. Yeah. <laughs> I can't pronounce English words. So. <laughs> uh, if someone was to have the Greek understanding of transubstantiation and and not confess the whole accident substance distinction, I think one could still be very well in communion um, because we're not just because we're committed to saying that is the true body and blood of Christ um, in a very in the most real sense, just as it was. Uh, when he walked the earth, not in the sense of hypostatic union as Luther, not in the sense of Calvin, where it's a virtual presence, but a real presence, then I think that's fully sufficient to be in good communion with uh, with the Roman Catholic understanding, which is why uh, which is why I don't think we'd allot you the same place as we would uh, the Protestants. Uh, which, which I would agree, and it's a shame that there's this sort of reflex. Well, if it's Roman Catholic, it's got to be wrong, and if it's Protestant, it's got to be wrong. And mm-hmm. so transubstantiation is theor- is supposedly Roman Catholic. So if you see the word, well, they got to be getting it wrong because they're Roman Catholic. And, I mean, that's like saying Roman Catholics use the word Trinity, so it has to be wrong. It's just not a good idea. And um, we ha- we see it here in this conciliar document. We see the same substance accidents uh, distinction in this document. I personally will use the terminology because the council does. Right. And all right. So – that's all well and good. And uh, let's also talk about uh, one other thing. And this is actually something I brought into a, a debate that I had with Barely Protestant, not in the actual debate itself. We were having a debate about whether or not Anglican orders were valid. Um, the debate itself, I didn't bring up that this point, but I actually did cite this council in an article I wrote about how the intentions uh, concerning the sacrifice make uh, Anglican orders invalid. Because if you don't have a, a sacrificial priesthood, you don't really have a priesthood, which is what I contended the 39 articles uh, denied. Um, he's not of the same opinion. He believes that the 39 articles don't rule out a sacrificial priesthood, but I digress. It says here in the Council of Jerusalem, for one is the adoration of the Holy Tr- uh, Sorry, I'll go with the beginning further, that the body itself of the Lord and the blood that are in the mystery of the Eucharist ought to be honored in the highest manner and adored with latria, Greek adoration or worship. For one is the adoration of the Holy Trinity and of the body and blood of the Lord. Further, that it is a true and propitiatory sacrifice offered for all Orthodox living and dead and for the benefit of all, as is set forth explicitly in the prayers of the mysteries delivered to the church by the apostles in accordance with the command they received from the Lord. So the sacrifice. So part of our understanding of a sacrifice is when a sacrifice is offered to God, um, not just a, a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, as can be found in the Psalms, uh, and offering up such as prayers to God, but a true adoration of a sacrificial victim who is Christ. Um, such a thing, when it is done, has some kind of um, effect on one where one is forgiven of sins or one has um, the effects of sin uh, removed uh, from 
from one's uh, not from one's soul. And this is why it can be given to for the living and for the dead as well. Uh, would you like to comment on that as well? Do you think that's a, a fair way of uh, uh, expressing the orthodox view on uh, transubstantiation? Well, I'd agree with you. We do the liturgy for all the same reasons you do a mass, mm -hmm. right? It, it has efficacy um, for the dead. It has efficacy for the living. It is a representation of the actual sacrifice on Calvary, which this decree is emphatic about. Um, so in all those respects, it's exactly the same as the Roman Catholic uh, doctrine. I'm not sure if I would personally infer, I'm going to say the keyword personally, that because people have the wrong intention, let's say Anglicans particularly, then they forfeited their right as priest. Um, there's two comments I'd have on this document, but most, keywords most orthodox um, don't believe Anglicans have valid orders. Um, but that aside, it's like throwing a rock at a bee's nest, that for one, this decree explicitly states that you have to be in communion with the Orthodox Church in order to have a valid Eucharist. And so this speaks valid to- Valid or licit? I'm sorry? Valid or licit, because valid means that um, it is truly the body. So to, when I say this mass is valid, I'm saying that the body and blood of Christ is there. Um, it has gone from being uh, bread and wine to being the actual body and blood of Christ. But I could also say, for example, yeah, that's going on there. It's valid, but it's not licit. So I could be saying, yeah, it's it's going on, but it would be illegal, uh, hence licit versus illicit. Yeah, I was saying for any valid, Catholic to go. All right. Yeah. In the last paragraph, it says, this mystery of the sacred Eucharist can be performed by none other except by an Orthodox priest who has received this priesthood from an Orthodox canonical bishop in accordance with the teaching of the Eastern Church. Um, so that seems to me that you can't do this. It's not possible apart from being in the Orthodox Church. And just popularly speaking, I've never heard someone say that the Eucharist of a, a different communion is, is valid within Orthodoxy. I, maybe people more learned than me could pass more comment on that. Um, but there's a certain... Um, and a, I won't comment for Roman Catholicism or any other communions, inconsistencies in sacramental theology, but there is a certain, a certain seeming inconsistency in Orthodox sacraments of theology, and we can perceive it from this document. For example, it will it says uh, explicitly that the baptism of those outside of the Orthodox Church are valid. So you could have the sacrament of baptism um, outside the Orthodox Church. Um, here we see you cannot have the Eucharist outside of the Orthodox Church. We know from the Russians that when Uniates are brought into communion with the Orthodox Church, they don't reordain their, their priests or their bishops. Now think about that for a moment. Mm -hmm. That means every ordination going back to the Roman Catholic bishop who first went to schism and, and ordained the whole line of bishops that ended up ordaining this guy brought into communion had to be valid for him to be really a priest, mm -hmm. right? So we even recognize ordinations outside the Orthodox Church, which is really interesting, but we don't. Uh, we do not recognize the Eucharist. So um, I'm not going to here defend, well, how is that possible? I'm just repeating what has been consistent canonically. Um, and that doesn't mean the canons even themselves have, I wouldn't say there's, they're as inconsistent as people claim, but there's been differences in emphasis in how much we will accept baptisms inside the church. And that, and if you're there on the ground, one church will chrismate you and another will rebaptize you. And it's another episode to talk about what canons are drawing from and how they're interpreting them. But point being is, while we could accept baptisms from and ordinations from outside the church, the same would not be true for the Eucharist. So uh, if I might look over the paragraph again further, that this mystery of the sacred Eucharist can be performed by not another, except by an Orthodox bishop who has received priesthood from an Orthodox and canonical bishop in accordance with the teaching of the Eastern Church. This is uh, compendiously the doctrine and the true confession and the most ancient of the Catholic Church concerning this mystery, which must not be departed from in any way such as would be orthodox and would reject the novelties and profane the vanities of heretics, but necessarily the tradition of the institution must be kept whole and unimpaired for those that transgress the Catholic Church of Christ rejects and anathemizes. So from there, when I said uh, can be performed by none other, uh, it could mean can as in possibility, 
or it could mean can in the sense of uh, being something of a legal rule, like you, this is what you can or can't do. I I think the text itself here might be uh, might need to be um, weighed in in comparison to other synods. So, for example, there might be enough ambiguity where another synod could say it's invalid or just illicit. But at least from that that paragraph that that I'm just uh, reading from, I think it could work in either direction. Uh, but but that's just my uh, initial take. Uh, uh, if you'd like to just cl- uh, close on that particular issue, uh, then you can. I, I don't want to take over my guest's last word. Well, no, I mean, I guess we could agree to disagree. Mm-hmm. I'm being informed by just uh, my tradition, but admittedly, um, I don't have another canon in my mind right now that's weighing directly on that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'll just leave it there. All right. Uh- now let's go to the next issue of uh, does it teach purgatory? Because this is uh, this is another thing which uh, I believe uh, I've even cited in the past to the Orthodox. Uh, they I've been uh, not been welcomed too fondly for doing this. I think you're going to tell me f- the reasons exactly why this is the case. But uh, let's uh, actually uh, uh, maybe let's get an understanding of. Hades first, because that's something I think uh, we need good background over. Now, my understanding of Hades is this, uh, uh, and the old, at least from a biblical perspective, uh, in the Old Testament, all souls went to Hades, and Christ kind of explicates uh, the difference between uh, where the righteous were in Hades, in the bosom of Abraham, and where the uh, evildoers were, such as the rich man. Uh, now Lazarus and uh, is in the bosom of Abraham with the uh, with all the righteous fathers of the Old Testament. They're awaiting the coming of the resurrection. Uh, and in the old time of the Old Testament, the peop- the evildoers were on the other side of the chasm in Hades. And with the coming of Christ, Hades has been destroyed, and the saints of the Old Testament are brought into. Uh, the be- in, are brought into the beatific vision, which is just they're brought before the presence of God. I think in more Eastern theology, uh, especially more influenced with uh, uh, by uh, Gregory Palamas, uh, it would be uh, they would be enjoying the full energies of God, and they'd be uh, ready for the resurrection of the dead. Uh, but either way you slice it, uh, they are with God in, uh, if not in essence, then at least in then at least through his activities, whereas uh, the people in Hades are still undergoing the same torments. But uh, what's interesting here is that um, we read, and the souls of those involved in mortal sins who have not departed in despair, but while still living in the body, though without bringing forth any fruits of repentance, have repented by pouring forth tears by kneeling while watch, while watching in prayers, by afflicting themselves, by revealing the poor, and by finally uh, showing forth by their works their love towards God and their neighbor, and which the Catholic Church has from the beginning rightly called satisfaction, their souls depart into Hades, and there endure the punishments due to the sins they have committed. But they are aware of their future release from there, and are delivered by the supreme goodness through the prayers of the priest and the good works which the relatives of each do for their departed especially the unbloody sacrifice benefiting the most, which each offers particularly for his relatives that have fallen asleep and which the Catholic and apostolic church offers daily for all alike. Um, Of course, it is understood that we do not know the time of their release. We know and believe that there is deliverance for such from their direful condition and that before the common resurrection and judgment, but when we know not, end quote, and this is re- and this is uh, decree number eighteen, and I and I will say this much: um, there is no purgatory in the sense of a third place. If there is a there, that's not elaborated here in this decree. And from my understanding, in the West, what has uh, traditionally been ascribed is a a threefold area. There is uh, the there is being in the beatific vision of God. There is purgatory, uh, which is separate from Hades, and there has been traditionally uh, hell itself, which is uh, the ha- which just continues to be uh, where the wicked are held until they're dumped into the lake of fire. That's actually another thing 
in the book of Revelations, the lake of fire is considered to be where the souls who are awaiting in Hades in torment are going to be put back into their bodies. And during the, uh, the days of final judgment, after being united with their soul, they're going to be in the lake of fire, which there's been speculation on. There hasn't been any kind of official dogma concerning it. Um, Thomas Aquinas thought it was going to be in the center of the earth. Um, Greg, uh, John Chrysostom thought it's not even going to be in the universe, uh, uh, at least from what uh, St. Alphonse Liguori says. Uh, but, uh, but that's mostly speculative. I won't touch on that too much. But what I will say is purgatory seems to be a third place, where, whereas in the East, purgatory is considered to be on kind of that spectrum between being fully within the presence of God, fully sanctified, um, and on the other end, where it's just fully at variance and scorn at him in light of his illustrious presence. And people who are stuck where in a place where they have some kind of uh, mortal sin or as the scripture says sin on to death they're in a um they're going to be uh, in in the last place but those who don't have it are going to be somewhere in the middle where they could eventually be brought uh, there through uh, various intercessions is there anything i said right there which you would take umbrage with which you would say doesn't really capture it or uh, is there anything you'd like to add uh, it's the issue of purgatory in many respects has been treated unfairly in uh, my my baby's <laughs> grabbing where the camera is. I apologize. The the and so if you hear in the background, you know what's going on. the The issue of purgatory has in many ways been treated not fairly by Orthodox, and this includes conciliar documents. The treatment of purgatory in Saint Peter Mogila's Confession, um, for example, which is the is really the Pan Orthodox Synod of Jassy in sixteen forty two, is it, it borders, it's, I think it was edited from the council. It's actually not from St. Peter Mogila. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, it's not a fair treatment of Roman Catholic theology, um, but it, Roman Catholics are in part to blame because of popularly what they really did believe. No, so, actually, uh, actually, could I touch on that? Because sure. that's, that's a fair point. Um, so, for example, purgatory was actually true. And uh, and to be fair, this is actually a point that even uh, Mark of Ephesus had to bring up in the Council of Florence. Purgatory was not treated just merely as a place of sanctification, which is that bare minimum what you need to accept. But it's also been taught as being, in another sense, punitive on top of that as well. Now, in terms of what even uh, Cardinal, uh, Cardinal at the Ratzinger. time Ratzinger yeah. said, but e even... Uh, who later on went to become Pope Benedict the Sixteenth? You could actually believe in a purgatory that happens in a near flash of the eye, as in like a personal uh, uh, experience with Christ that just relinquishes all that. That would even be enough uh, to meet the satisfaction, to meet uh, the demands of the doctrine. And even the Catechism of the Catholic Church says the Church gives the name purgatory to the final purification of the elect which is entirely different from the punishment of the damned. The church formulated her doctrine of faith on purgatory, especially at the Council of Florence and Trent. The tradition of the church, by reference to certain texts of scripture, speaks of a cleansing fire. So uh, I, I will say this much, though. I, I think it's fair to say at Florence, even if Mark of Ephesus rejected the council in totality, I think it's fair to say he won at the end of the day uh, in, in terms of what the Catholic Church would have ended up accepting as the bare minimum and anything else would have might have been centuries well, later but yeah, like yeah they didn't accept it at the time which is part of the problem he was doing i think th he had three sermons against purgatory yeah. and it's very telling that no one stood up and said but we really believe that you know we're just speaking past each other that's like the modern <laughs> ecumenist way of dealing with the issue but uh, saint, saint mark the ascetic was making the orthodox case and at that time even though it's not been dogmatized, what they understood as dogma, being that they did dogmatize purgatory in Florence, um, did not match orthodox doctrine as they understood it. Otherwise, they would have accepted what St. Mark, uh, Mark of Ephesus was teaching on it. So let me, it's going to uh, help understand this document, but this this actual uh, decree. Could I just sorry, make? Uh, oh, sorry. Could I just make one more point? Because the sure. Catholic, because the Catechism does also add this part, and this is actually something I've taken um, at odds with um, other um, Orthodox, with uh, at least one of my Orthodox philosophers, 
it it says as for certain faults we must believe that before the final judgment there is a purifying fire he who is truth says that whoever utters blasphemy against the holy spirit will be pardoned neither in this age nor the age to come from this sentence we understand that certain offenses can be forgiven in this age but certain others in the age to come um oh and uh the let's see uh Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, and it also says, let us help and commemorate them if Job's sons were purified by their father's sacrifice. Why would we doubt that our offering of the dead bring them to some sort of consolation? Let us not hesitate to help those who have died and offer our prayers to them. Uh, the first quote I read was from uh, St. Gregory the Great. And there there does seem to be some kind of uh, language of punishment. Uh, the second one, of course, is is not um is taken from another source that would be um the council of leons in 1274 but uh, the point of it is uh while in the past it's been uh, the doctrine has always claimed some kind of uh legalistic understanding that's not integral to the doctrine itself the only integral thing to the doctrine as at least as far as what we can see has been uh, the purification of the elect portion. And that's about it. Uh, sorry, your thoughts? Yeah, it's. I've done a show with this with an Orthodox priest, Father John Whiteford, and it was two hours. So we're not going to be able to like, super unpack this strictly from the decree. Um, the decree essentially agrees with what I will call really the modern understand Roman Catholic understanding of purgatory. Um, in most parts, other than the concept of treasury merits and vicarious merits. All right, because obviously it's not in this decree, and um, we don't understand vicarious merit as the means in which uh, the people being released from Hades, as we see here, because it doesn't say so. It treats the topic and it doesn't mention that concept. Um, but it will help to see that fundamentally the same thing's happening. It's not altogether fair when an Orthodox person says, well, we don't believe in purgatory, you know, we don't, we don't believe, we believe only heaven and hell. And it's like, well, not exactly, because we believe people go to hell, but what fundamentally occurs to some people in hell is the same thing of what occurs to people in the Roman Catholic doctrine of purgatory. It's very important we identify that. And kind of like from Dante, right, in the Purgatorio, in the Divine Comedy, we see that people in purgatory are awaiting their release. They're not suffering for no reason. They love God. We can infer the exact same thing from this decree. It says they're aware of their release. It's not like they're in hell and they don't know if they're going to ever get out. <laughs> you know, like I hope I get enough prayers to get out. No, that's that's not what it says. So even the mindset of the people in Hades would be similar to the popularly understood mindset of the penitent in purgatory in Roman Catholicism. So it's, I think, sufficiently clear that the Roman Catholic doctrine began as a Western development and in Western terminology of the Orthodox doctrine. Um, the issue of purgation is also Orthodox. This is all over the writings of St. Gregory and Issa, and it's been sadly misunderstood to be talking about universalism, which it's not. Um, and both Roman Catholic scholarship and Orthodox since uh, the late, since the 1990s have now moved to this. So popularly, everyone thinks St. Gregory and Issa is this universalist, but that's like the old scholarly consensus. Better scholars, better readers have since taken issue with that, as well as my own personal reading concurs with the more recent reading of St. Gregory and Issa. But what he, he is teaching fundamentally is purgation after death. And so you're in Hades, and you're being released by the prayers of the church, the, um, the liturgy done on your behalf, and the efficacy of you being there in the meantime is it is purging you from sin. It's making you more godly. And so this really corresponds with the orthodox view of theosis and also of the energy essence distinction, which we do not have the time to get into. But essentially, the punishment and the reward in orthodoxy is an experience of God's energies, his uncreated energia. And so that means... The light of heaven and the fire of hell is the same thing. It's not a created reality. It's an uncreated reality. It's the will of the individual that determines how it manifests itself. But someone who dies with, as we see in this decree, a will that repented but with no fruits of repentance, um, thereby 
um, needs really miracles, which is why they need prayers, why they need grace for their will to actually assimilate to um, the manifestation of that interior reality they died with, right? And so it's not all that different, but what doesn't happen is that Theotokos merits aren't transmitted to you uh, a an indulgence, even though you have the right, because uh, I know for an indulgence to work, you need the right intent, even though the right intent doesn't do anything for you because that's not what's occurring. It's not that you're lacking a certain degree of merits and you need some more merits onto the scale until you go to heaven. Um, what is occurring is you have a will that's been distorted away from God. It got turned back to God at the right time when you died, but it didn't bear the fruit. So now you need the miracle for that interior reality to manifest itself after death. Because they're the quote on uh, St. Pope Clement in Second Clement, there is no repentance after death. So we see that doctrine from the first century um, all the way in the 17th century document. But there, there's so much here. The point of what I'm doing today isn't now to say, well, here's why I don't believe in vicarious merit. Here's why I don't believe in indulgences. That's that's not the point we're talking about right now. But that is the background here. If you understand that they – and if you control F on this document, the word operations, you will see it's used a lot because the, the energy operations, the word in Greek energeia means wor uh, works. It's the energy essence distinction. And so – this would have been understood by the conciliar fathers of the Council of Jerusalem, 1672. And this was precisely the sort of arguments that St. Mark the Ascetic was making during Florence, which none of the conciliar fathers on the Roman Catholic side of Florence um, agreed with, which was the one amongst other impasses at that council. So I personally see it as good that the Roman Catholic doctrine purgatory is moving towards what we see here in decree uh, in the decree in this council. Um, I think there are still differences that I think ultimately will not be bridgeable. Mm -hmm. But fundamentally, for the average person, right? If you're not a theologian, it's pretty much the same thing, mm -hmm. right? Well, they didn't. Agree, well, they didn't agree with uh, Mark of Ephesus. Uh, I don't believe there were any condemnations of what he said. Were there? <laughs> We don't have the minutes of Florence oh, wow. translating English, so I have to now. I'm, what you see me doing is thinking of what I've read in secondary sources, mm. and um, it's been too long since I read particularly how his mm. treatment of purgatory was responded to. All I can remember vaguely at the moment is that it was rejected in some way, but I, I can't. I can't get to any detail. So if I'm wrong, I apologize. No worries. Uh, it would be one thing if it was anathemized, because at that point we would say that's a completely blasphemous understanding. But if it was just not accepted or ascended to, at least that would leave room later on for uh, for some kind of shared understanding to have developed. Um, that, that would actually be... And, and, and I'll just interject real quick. It does show a difference to how Roman Catholics and Orthodox uh, understand councils. Orthodox view the minutes of councils as also dogmatically binding. It's been called by Father Richard Price, who's a Roman Catholic scholar, conciliar fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have this dogmatic dispute and the other side rejects it or just doesn't accept it, then we would understand that they rejected mm -hmm. something we consider dogmatic. If people are curious in the actual Council Jerusalem, um, the they actually make a passive reference to the acts of the ecumenical councils. And I think it's also question four, if I remember right. Um, so you actually see this kind of orthodox way. Yeah, it is question four, this orthodox way of understanding what's authoritative in the council. Just like I mentioned the thing about hymns, you also see the acts of the councils mentioned, not just the canons and decrees. So we don't need something to be explicitly laid out and then anathematized or or in a canon for it to have authority or to have dogmatic authority. Um, so again, it, it does speak to a sort of epistemic difference in how we understand what carries authority. Right, and, and just to point out one other thing, uh, just because something isn't anathemized doesn't mean it doesn't have authority for us either. It just means it has kind of a, a different or lesser authority. So for example, the, the Second Vatican Council, it never actually says, if you reject such and such a belief, uh, you are anathema. And it never actually does that, uh, not once. It never dogmatically defines anything in a kind of an ex-cathedra way 
uh, such as was done in prior councils or even when the Pope speaks um, in a way that's infallible. Rather, they're just really summing up a lot of the doctrines on what is to be accepted. And we accept that as kind of uh, binding unless you can, and if you're and if you disagree, someone would be in a very uh, sinful state unless there was like something weighing on their conscience so much in the past where it was like, yeah, I can't accept this as being, you know, a continuation uh, of the true teachings of the past. I, I forget the exact levels of this, but I won't go into that today because we need to touch on one more subject, which is original sin. Now, this is actually something you want to bring up, and I'm guessing it's because, and this is my guess. Uh, the council seems to be teaching um, uh, the following with regards to baptism, uh, although correct me if I'm wrong here. In Decree 16, it, we read, We believe holy baptism, which was instituted by the Lord and is conferred in the name of the Holy Trinity to be the highest necessity. For without it, none is able to be saved. As the Lord said, whoever is not born of water and the spirit shall in no way enter the kingdom of heaven. And, and therefore, baptism is necessary even for infants since they also are subject to original sin and without baptism are not able to obtain its remission, which the Lord showed when he said, not of some only, but simply and absolutely, whoever is not born again, which is the same as saying, all that after the kingdom of Christ the Savior would enter into the kingdom of heaven must be regenerated. And since infants are men and as such need salvation, needing salvation, they also need baptism." Now, what's interesting about this is if you accept um, this claim, it's very hard not to get into like a an understanding of uh, a kind of limbo if you're a Roman Catholic, although uh, the doctrine of limbo is very iffy today, but um, uh, it's something it I'll be, get. <laughs> it, it shouldn't be. It should, no, it definitely should not be. I accept it fully. <laughs> But uh, what's interesting about it is if you read a lot of contemporary Orthodox theologians, they're like, oh, of course it fits getting to heaven. Although this uh, seems to speak more to a, a pessimistic tradition. Um, now, and to be fair, uh, Craig, I think even in a private Facebook discussion, you actually uh, side more with uh, the pessimistic tradition if uh, memory served correctly. Uh, would you care to expand on that? Well, first... Both our sides do not believe in inherited guilt, the strict Augustinian mm -hmm. view. That's exactly. in the Roman Catholic Catechism. And there's Roman, there's Orthodox sources and even saints that I respect and appreciate and pray to, mm -hmm. and they will frame the Roman Catholic view in that, but it's not in their catechism, <laughs> right? They, they've never dogmatically affirmed um, Augustine's view. And that aside, it's, the most binding statement we have from Roman Catholics presently explicitly rejects it. Uh, if I in the Catechism, it's somewhere between 402 or, and 405, something like that. But that's that's generally where it is. So let's get that off the table for a second. They do not Roman Catholics do not believe in inherited guilt. All right. So whatever is killing these infants and sending them to hell is not that they inherited the actual penalty of Adam, um, his guilt for that transgression that no one believes that. So let, let's get that off the table entirely. But we also affirm um, as I, I'm the keyword is I hope, I don't know this. I'm going to take on good faith that Roman Catholics still do affirm that unbaptized infants normatively go to hell. Um, maybe not in extraordinary circumstances. We don't know about these, these things. Um, we both venerate, for example, the martyr, the innocents that Herod killed. They were obviously right. not baptized. So, so baptized we accept, in blood. I'm sorry, baptized in blood. But right. So we accept people not physically baptized in heaven, right? We right. have a doctrine for that. Um, and so, and uh, this idea that the bapt that these infants have no intent to be martyrs attain to mar the martyric baptism stretches it to the limit. And it's a limit I'm happy it stretched because God is more gracious than we could possibly imagine, right? Mm -hmm. So normatively, right? We're talking normatively, unbaptized infants go to hell. We will affirm St. Augustine in this, St. Prosper Aquitaine, Canon 110 of the Council of Carthage, which a uh, 419, which we talked about is of ecumenical authority because mm -hmm. it's in the second canon of the Sixth Ecumenical Council. Um, by the way, on the issue of limbo, and then let's talk about it a little bit. 
limbo is in the Latin manuscript of that canon, but not the Greek. So if you are a theologically consistent Roman Catholic, I think you have to accept limbo because it's in the 110th canon, but it's telling that it didn't receive church-wide reception, the, the limbo specifically, because it wasn't except they, they wouldn't even translate into Greek. And if you get to nitty gritty manuscripts, that's because when they translate these things, that gives an opportunity for that side to receive the doctrine. Mm -hmm. That's why the Russians, when they translated this council of Jerusalem 1672, changed a couple of things because what they changed is what they didn't receive. All right. So that aside, let's talk about limbo a little bit. The concept of limbo is not illegitimate. As in the concept, this thing very broadly, mm -hmm. right? In the 2 Corinthians 5.10 states, and 2 Corinthians 5.10 is cited in this council, I believe, in Decree 16. No, it's 13. So it's 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 actually in the minds of those conciliar fathers that we will be judged according to works that we've done in the body, mm -hmm. right? So what bad work is the infant judge for to go to hell in his condemnation? So to quote St. Augustine and against Julianus, it's book four, no, book five. I can't remember the paragraph. I think it's 43. All right. And just and just for those who are real dorks, the translator in English, that paragraph number will not match the Latin manuscripts. He pretty much it's a paraphrase and and a abridged version of the actual against Julianus. Um, so but in the English paragraph number, it's 43. Um, that being said, Augustine himself says there are sins where it's better that you've never been born than to have committed that sin. Right, because Jesus talks about that. It's better a millstone be thrown around their neck and thrown into the ocean, you know, um, than to lead one of my little ones astray. That's a very rough paraphrase, but roll with me here, you know. Than to do that, right? So there's those sins where it's better you've never been born than this eternal suffering in in damnation in hell. But Augustine says, "This is Augustine. I will not say this is true of infants." Because they didn't do any good or bad. So he affirmed they're in hell, but it, it's not going to be all that. It would actually be better that they be in hell than they never exist. So now let's think about that for a second, right? Well, how could it be better not to be in hell, uh, to be in hell, but yet not exist? Well, obviously that experience of hell, according to Augustine, would not be this sort of suffering that's better than non-existence. So what can we, now this could be more speculative for a moment, compare this to? Well, to natural goods. So I'll just say this for a second. Uh, eating a pleasant sandwich, right? It's not heaven. Heaven's dispassionate. So you're not going to be eating sandwiches for the pleasantness of food's sake. Doesn't mean food necessarily wouldn't exist. It's a whole other issue. But eating a sandwich isn't a bad thing, but it's like this natural good. It, it It's not what the heavenly reward is, which is an right. experience of the divine, right? So Infants that are baptized, their damnation is they're not going to be cooperating with the uncreated grace of God and so that they're going to be enjoying it, but yet they don't have a will turned against it. So they're not going to be suffering from their exposure to this. They'll just be experiencing in whatever state how you would experience natural good, just natural goods because there's no nothing immoral about them. So it makes sense in the Latin tradition to go, well, it's not heaven, it's not hell, it's limbo. Right, it's not purgatory. There's no atoning or or growing in a appreciation of God, and however that works in a Roman Catholic view of purgatory, it makes sense to call it limbo. Mm -hmm. But here in Orthodoxy, just like we treat purgatory not as a place, we go there's heaven and there's hell. There's a Hades and there's and there's heaven. Right? We treat it as binary. In the same sense, we treat the um. Ju the judgment of infants with original sin, which is clear that they have, because it says explicitly in the council, as a binary, that they will not be saved. That's why they need baptism. Mm -hmm. This is something affirmed by later Orthodox saints. Um, Saint Nikolai Zika, who's Serbian, he also taught in England for a while. He was a confessor because he went into, a, he was brought to a Nazi concentration camp. Um, there's a whole thing with the Croats because the Roman Catholic gets way into World War II history, which we won't do right now. He died in Pennsylvania. So this guy's not some country bumpkin. This is a saint that went all throughout the world. His catechism states emphatically that those who don't 
baptize their children are their murderers, right? So this idea that unbaptized infants, oh, they go to heaven. It's Roman Catholics that are meanies and send them to hell. That's not the teaching of our saints. That's not the teaching of our councils, all right? Normatively, right? We, we can't talk about these. We already know there's these extraordinary exceptions. It's, it'd be fun to do a show on that, but we want to talk about what is the normative dogma, what we should expect and not turn the um, the extraordinary into the rule, right? What is ordinary, what's normative is the rule. So let me say this about original sin then. If we don't believe in inherited guilt of both us Roman Catholics and us Orthodox, then what is killing these people, right? Why does this infant go to hell? Why does this infant um, die, right? Because, you know, penalty of death is sin. He didn't commit sin. This is something where I'll say I'll give a little tidbit, a little snack. We're not going to totally unpack this. But this is where the Roman Catholic view has it dogmatized um, this, unlike the Orthodox, which is the Roman Catholic view is it could be original sin is both concupiscence, or have you pronounced that term? Concupiscence. The perversion of will against God that's concupiscence. hereditary, as well as death, which is hereditary. But there's also Roman Catholics that take the view that no, original sin is only concupiscence, but we view the penalty curse of death as separate. So, for example, the Theotokos, there are Roman Catholics that believe that she did die, but her death is not the result of original sin. Because, again, Roman Catholic doctrine, medical conception is she never committed sin. She can't die. Now, the Orthodox doctrine is different. We believe that death is is a result of original sin, and it's part and parcel with the moral fall, with concupiscence. And we could see that actually in this council, which is, uh, just to bring it up, um, I just want to get the decree number. In decree six, I'll just read this part. It says, we believe the first man created by God to have fallen in paradise when disregarding the divine commandment, he yielded to the deceitful counsel of the serpent. Mm -hmm. And as a result, hereditary sin, right? So the, the results of the sin flow to his posterity so that everyone who is born after the flesh bears this burden and experiences the fruits of it in this present world. By these fruits and this burden, we do not understand sin or actual sin, the translation says. So we don't mean that he actually, we actually inherit the sins of other people, that guilt. And then it gives examples such as impiety, blasphemy, murder, sodomy, adultery, fornication, enmity, whatever else is by our depraved choice committed contrary to the divine will, not from nature. Just as a little aside here, they're responding to Calvinist and the, the uh, confession of Cairo Lucaris, which would say that man was totally depraved. Mm -hmm. So we can't will good. That's against Orthodox anthropology. We have not lost the divine image of God. We could will good. It's just been fallen and distorted by original sin. So this continues in Decree 6. For many, both of the forefathers and of the prophets and vast numbers of others, as well as those under the shadow of the law, as well as under the truth of the gospel, mm -hmm. such as the divine precursor, that is John the Baptist. We believe he's sinless. This comes from the Council of Ephesus. Um, and especially the mother of God, the word, the ever virgin Mary, did not experience these sins or such like faults. Right, Mary never committed sins. John the Baptist never committed any sins. Infants never committed any sins. Right, so they have original sin, Orthodox believe, but they never committed acts of sin. They did not inherit the guilt of sin. But what what did happen? But only what the divine justice inflicted upon man as a punishment for the original transgression, such as sweat and labor, afflictions, bodily sicknesses pains and childbearing, and finally while on our pilgrimage to live a laborious life, and lastly bodily death. So we see in the Orthodox definition, bodily death is part of original sin, which is why we, be, we might speak past each other of the Immaculate Conception, because that's our definition. We cannot understand the Immaculate Conception the same way that a, um, that a Roman Catholic does. Okay. Also, as a tidbit, I'll just say, there's a reason why we die. Because we believe life is sustained by the divine energies of God. If we get more into this council, it's implied. It's more explicit in other mm. documents and the teachings of the saints. So it's because 
cocky pistons exist, not because you actually even think about it. Like we don't believe Mary was con actively contemplating any of the passions. We believe she turned away from every, every sort of passion, mm -hmm. but because she had this susceptibility to be inflicted by the passions, this is something that leads to death because that only existed after the fall. Jesus Christ did not have that. Adam did not have that before the fall. This is discussed in book three, chapter 20 of St. John of Damascus um, exposition of the Orthodox faith. So that's why we view death as part of the moral fall because no moral fall means you're always divinized by God's energy, which means you'll always live. And the moral fall means you're not cut off by that divinizing energy, which means you will die. And so the Orthodox see them as essentially connected, while Roman mm -hmm. Catholic theology has never dogmatized that. But you could see there, here in this decree, in Decree 6, it's explicitly taken for granted, which is why it names sinless people and says that's why they die. It's because of that original transgression. So mm -hmm. um, there's so much where we agree. There's a little bit where a lot of us disagree, but there are Roman Catholic, I would say, Mariological prelapsarianists which will affirm this understanding of original sin, but that's why they'll argue that the Theotokos was a uh, prelapsarian in her, in, her, in her flesh. She was not fallen. And so that's more consistent than the post-lapsarianist view. But these are all debates, even in Christology within mm -hmm. Roman Catholicism since the 1800s. So it gets a little beyond us here. But I thought that was just interesting to bring out because we have this dogmatic definition of original sin in this document in many respects agrees with one camp of Roman Catholicism. It also explicitly contradicts another camp of Roman Catholicism. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't make them wrong because we're, it only makes one camp wrong, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Oh, no, that's fair enough. Although it, it should be stated in terms of the assumption of Mary and her relationship with death, uh, it was specifically formulated in a way where um, both traditions, uh, because some of us, uh, myself included, uh, believe that she was assumed into heaven without dying. Uh, that, that would be my own camp. And there's another camp, which I would say is not heterodox. It's fully within uh, the Orthodox line of thinking in Catholicism that says she did die, but both her body and soul were taken up into heaven, but separately. Um, and that's affirmed by most, uh, more of the, e of, uh, yeah, of the East. In the West, it tends to be the bodily assumption um, where she doesn't die. Because well, it, 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 yeah. it makes more sense with the orthodox doctrine for original sin, right? Yeah. Because if she didn't sin, then she couldn't die, <laughs> right? <laughs> Eve couldn't die. So um, I would actually say that is really the better of the two Roman Catholic opinions, the pre-lapsarianist view, uh, the post-lapsarianist view, which would be that uh, that she did die because the body could die, but the but she otherwise wasn't touched by any sin, original sin creates all sorts of theological problems. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, if you take, like you, you admittedly do, a very Latin-based theology and go, yes, we're in communion with these Eastern churches that have this other view, but this is the correct view, that makes more sense than trying to say that the, the Unit views are actually the correct doctrine because it, it throws, I think, the Immaculate Conception to contradiction. Right. Uh, although I will say this much, um, my uh, thinking of it is not necessarily from my Latin views, although uh, there is something to that. Um, my main basis for the doctrine is uh, scripture, funnily enough. Maybe I'm thinking too much like a Protestant here, but in uh, the book of Revelations, chapter 9, um, if you understand uh, the, the woman who is taken up onto the wings of heaven as the Virgin Mary, as I do, although I think it also doubles in meaning as the church of believers as well. I, I don't think both those doctrines are incompatible reading in one verse. There are other times in the book of revelation where, uh, once where one symbol has two meanings, uh, Pope Benedict the 16th actually gives a, an example. I can't think of the top of my head, but that's generally my understanding. That's my, uh, go to place where I understand it. And if I'm going to be consistent, oh, we affirm to his bodily we affirm she was bodily assumed as well. We just believe she died first. Right. So we, we, have a, we have a iconography. It's beautiful, really, mm -hmm. where, right, just like Jesus received Jesus as an infant when he became incarnate, Jesus Christ receives his mother's soul as an infant. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sorry, it makes me a little teary-eyed um, thinking Aww. about it. <laughs> but um, so that being said, it's, uh, you know, it's, 
because the order, it's dogmatic for us that the dormition, which means sleep, was an actual death. It, it, she, she was dead and the souls received first. Um, the whole other episode, but you get to the dormition homilies. Some will say her body then was immediately assumed afterwards. Others say it took three days. <laughs> we don't have a very firm chronology for this tradition, um, but we, we affirm her death while um, I'd say the majority Roman Catholics affirmed that, no, she was bodily assumed she never died, which would make sense that she was not touched in any way by original sin. Uh, although I would definitely say this much, though, uh, at least for Revelation 9, um, the the reason why I, I took it uh, to mean to not exclude death, but the reason I don't, I take the doctrine as to exclude death itself is because if my main understanding comes from Revelation is chapter nine, and there is no like explicit mention of death that's to come, then it's very hard for me to consider it um, in light of scripture, even though I do agree that there is a venerable tradition of it in, in the East too. Like uh, there are, I, I tend to look at what evidence is best available before coming to a decision. Um, like, for example, in the East, we view Joseph as being a very elderly man who uh, marries uh, the Theotokos as a way of protecting her. Uh, he, and uh, he acts as a guardian in that respect. Whereas in the West, uh, following St. Jerome, he's, he's an ascetic. He is a young man who marries a, a woman of an, e of an equal or lesser age. Uh, because she becomes the spouse of the Holy Spirit, he takes up a vow of chastity, lives a life with her, and uh, is able to do stuff like uh, take her to Egypt, uh, protect her, something which a more elderly man might not be able to do. Um, in either case, uh, looking at both evidences for that, I feel that Scripture also points better to the tradition where Joseph was an older male. Uh, for example, in Luke chapter 1, uh, the virgin says, How shall this be? I know not a man. She says it in the future tense. How shall this be? How will this be in the future? There's an assumption there she's already taken the vow. Whereas she's, it, would, it wouldn't make as much sense if you took the Latin view. Uh, the same issue happens when you contemplate it with um, the fact that she also um, would not have uh, done this if she wasn't uh, thinking of perpetual virginity as well, which kind of throws a wrench for the Protestants too. And mm -hmm. also it's a little easier to understand why uh, Jesus uh, has brothers and sisters. Yes, you, it could mean cousin too, but it's less of a stretch to imagine uh, it being uh, uh, step siblings as well. Um, so uh, I usually take a, a Bible first, and then I try to see which tradition best corresponds to that, unless the tradition itself is set up as infallible in and of itself, in, in which case I just go with that. We, we won't solve it today because right. it's not the topic, but I'll give you two scriptures to think about, which be in Revelation 12, I think verse 2, says that um, the woman with the, you know, the 12 stars gave birth in pain, which seems to me it's speaking of the martyrs in the church and not Theotokos because her birth was painless, uh. um, which is why the majority of saints haven't taken the Marian view of Revelation 12. It's become more in response to right, the Protestants that it's become a more of a popular interpretation, but it does pose difficulties. So even like modern Orthodox, I consider saints like Father Daniel Sezoy, if he was martyred, um, he um, took the view that it's just the church. He didn't take a Mariological view. That's my own personal reading. I'll, I'll also bring one other passage, which is Psalm um, 132, 8, which says, Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou and the ark of thy strength. So if we accept that Christ died, right, he went into rest, and the ark is Mary, she went into rest as well. So uh, we we believe there's biblical merit, but mm -hmm. when we talk about Mariological doctrines, it's a lot squishier. When you talk about allegories, it's not going to be as clear with some other doctrines. That's why when, if mm -hmm. Protestants listening to this, they, they find this like, what are you even talking about? You know, Because <laughs> they want it abounding in explicitness, which you're, you're not going to have on this issue. Right. And, and you know what, even uh, in terms of looking at Christological uh, precursors um, in the Old Testament. Like, uh, there's a particular psalm. I'm I'm trying to remember which one it is. It speaks of Christ being a stranger to his uh, mother's children and to his brothers, and that comes across as, oh well, if this is Christological, of course, this means that he Jesus had uh, 
literal brothers and these were Mary's offspring. But it also says that, um, oh, it also says that uh, God uh, uh, revealed his iniquities. But Christ doesn't have any iniquities. It's talking about David first. But then it's yeah. also, mm-hmm. yeah, but we, of course, understand that uh that it's speaking about Christ in a secondary way, which is not going to be a one-for-one comparison. So, for example, Augustine interpreted that as being uh, the mother and the children as not being Mary and his brothers, but rather the church, the synagogue. uh, Sorry, yeah, the mother is the synagogue and the synagogue's children as the Jews, uh, which which is actually a lot uh, better in terms of understanding. And that's why uh, even with these particular passages, they're not going... I could still understand them as being uh, not necessarily one for one readings, uh, especially with the woman, for example. Um, there, it might be a pain in another sense of the word. It might just be uh, because it's trying to match both the church and the virgin. That's going to speak about um, speak about uh, properties maybe more in relation to the one than the other. So uh, th- these are also some things to consider as well. How we understand. Uh, these uh, precursors in light of the tradition. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, so with that out of the way, uh, would you like to leave any remaining thoughts either about what I just said or even about the whole interview in question? Um, well, this interview is a lot of fun <laughs> and hopefully we could uh, tackle another topic at some time. I really enjoy um, getting two perspectives on it because it brings out both sides right. in some more detail than let's say you alone saying, well, this is what the Orthodox think. And here's what we think, but you're not hearing it from the Orthodox guy and vice versa. Right. <laughs> so I think, you know, I think this has been real great. One hand, I think the council of Jerusalem 1672 is important because it's the Orthodox church's best response to Protestantism. It also is our best explanation of so many important things um, which also pertain to the most similar to our communion, which would be the Roman Catholics, right? right. And, you know, or, or Oriental Orthodox, but you get the point. Um, so that being said, it's important because it's not ultra long and you you would benefit a lot from reading it. And you'd realize there's, n- there's not as much stuff where it's farly, as far divided on as we'd like to think. But also it's a challenge because we have to read this council in accordance with previous councils, mm. with subsequent catechisms like St. Philibert of Moscow, these certain documents that had church-wide authority. And we need to return to doing that as Orthodox, I'm speaking for now, because what there has been since the 20th century, since the fall of the Turks and then the, and then the communist yoke, has been the sort of Western captivity of orthodoxy and not see the Latin captivity, so to say, is what they call the 17th century document, but it wasn't like a real captivity. Like we talked about, they're bringing in Western teachers and getting their bishops taught in Italy because they had no choice, but at least they were still living within the orthodox world somewhat freely, somewhat. Mm -hmm. This is totally different under communism where you really couldn't exercise the faith at some periods at all. And you couldn't preach at all um, without going to the gulag. And so all theology, all discourse was in the West. And as a result, it almost became like this hyper reaction to what Protestants and Roman Catholics believed. And this hyper reaction then almost went where we forgot these other Orthodox documents, these considerably improved documents that the whole Orthodox world accepted as far as I could tell reading the history. And so hopefully into the 21st century where Orthodox lands have returned, though there's a kind of secular captivity, which, you know, I live in the United States, so we suffer this in a Protestant Roman Catholic country right now. But um, even though that exists, it's freer, not since COVID so much, but it's freer for the church. And hopefully now we can return to a more authentic Orthodoxy that is not a response and a reaction to something else. Just like trad Roman Catholics, so to say, go, okay, we're done with World War II and all the disillusionment of how horrible it was. Let's now return to actual Roman Catholicism. And it's probably going to take time for the boomers to go and you could really do that. But I really think that's what you've seen the millennials and the Zoomers that are Roman Catholics. It's sort of the same view. They're looking for not necessarily a reactionary, a reactionary swing, but a return to just the status quo without this overreaction to modernism and to disillusionment after World War II. So I think 
after that occurs for both of us, we will be on better grounds to have actual discussions on where we're different, where we're the same, and have truly fruitful ecumenical dialogue because it has to be based on truth and the authentic traditions of our church and not on the sort of